योगेन चित्तस्य पदेन वाचा मल शरीर से वैद्यक योपाकोत्तम प्रवर मुनीना पातंजलि प्राजलिरान तो So we will continue with our study of the Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So in the last class, we were studying the sutras, uh, which deals with the concept of vasana in the Yoga Sutra. The word vasana is used in almost all the Indian uh, regional languages, which is which is derived from Sanskrit. But the way we use it's actually the real meaning of vasana is not uh, all inclusive as we use in our original language in original language the word vasana means the desire but in yoga sutra the word vasana of course means the desires all those uh, samskaras the latent impressions in our mind which finds expression as the desire when it comes back as smriti as memory all the desires are there in the subconscious mind as samskara and as smriti they find expression as the desire and we think that alone to be the vasana but in yoga sutra the word vasana is technical it of course includes all those manifestors desires but it also includes all the unmanifested desires there are so many desires which is not manifested either in the present moment maybe in the future uh, if i get some favorable circumstances some desire which is hidden in my mind may suddenly find expression they become this uh, vyakta avyakta vyakta these two words will be used manifested unmanifested so there are many and vasanas actually include all whether it is manifested or not manifested from where when the life started in the entire process of evolution all the so called mental modules which we developed based on the likes and dislikes they are all actually is included in the term vasana so in the last class we were studying that that some of the vasanas in this life may not find expression it was something which was in my past life again in some future life if it gets some favorable circumstances those vasanas which are hidden in the present life may find expression so just for a quick recapitulation let us read the sutra and then we will go to the a short discussion and its implication what's its implication is because these sutras are not meant just for academic purpose it has some implication as per our day to day life is concerned so what's its implication as per our day to day life is concerned that also we will try to indicate so what was the ninth sutra jati desha kala vyavahitanam api anantaryam smriti samskarayo eka rupatva jati desha kala that we are born as a particular species say this human being desha even as a human being we find as per the demography is concerned that all are not born in the same circumstances as in australia the environment in which we grow up is not the same in some other countries say india or some european countries or in america each of the countries have its own circumstances environment the culture all those things are included in the desha 
is plus space desha and kala the time so uh, all those things vyavahitanam vyavahitanam means there may be an interruption because of all those things desha jati and kala vyavahitana there is an interruption api anantaryam there is anantaryam means there is a gap because suppose a in some past birth i have i got inclined to learn music but in the present birth i never got the scope i had some other profession other other inclinations in some future birth if again i am born in a circumstances where uh, practicing music developing the skill of music is favorable suddenly i will find that, that that skill will find expression as a child prodigy that as it was already cultured in some past birth when you get again the favorable circumstances that sanskara is not lost it is still there and that finds now as it gets that's ekarupatva it gets the favorable circumstances that samskara gets the favorable circumstances in the some future birth and now it finds expression so that's the uh, sutra which indicates that on account of similarity between the memory and the corresponding latent impressions smriti samskara ekarupatva the smriti of some past birth uh, is evolved is 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 generated is manifested when the particular samskara which we have developed in the past birth finds favorable circumstances to express itself in some future birth ekarupatva when there is a similarity between the memory and the corresponding latent impressions then what happens the vasanas which we have already spoken of in the previous sutras also we were discussing so these these vasanas what happen they manifest spontaneously even when the two states are separated by birth space and time desha jati desha kala vyavahita nam api anantaryam so what is the implication of this i understand that it is speaking something wonderful but what's the implication that whatever may be the circumstances in which i am at present the karma vada has a very fatalistic approach most of the time we find that when we are going through some suffering we try to satisfy ourselves we try to console ourselves by saying most probably it is because of my past karma what can i do i just have to suffer but it is something a very fatalistic attitude i still remember when i was in sydney few years back then from the cancer council a few person came to interact with the various religious leaders and that way uh, the swami in charge there he told that uh, you better meet them and when uh, we were having the conversation what they told was very interesting that to deal with the patients cancer patients who are from the indian origin sometimes become very difficult now why they never resort that the in that the inclination to resort to the treatment to motive to motivate them to uh, resort to some sort of treatment sometimes becomes very difficult it's not that they are very tensed agitated it's not that most probably they are to certain extent calm they have accepted that fact that they are uh, having a disease which is uh, in no way curable that somehow has entered their mind and it is because of some past birth some actions because of my past birth for which i am suffering at present i accept it and that way what happens there's no motivation to really resort to the various treatments sometimes we find they have developed that type of fatalistic approach so from as you are from the hindu tradition so what should be your uh, answer response to this type of attitude so we remember, i still remember we told that actually it is a very wrong way of understanding the theory of karma yes it is true that my past karma has resulted in my present but it is also true the way i uh, 
just uh, carry on with my life the attitudes the endeavors with which i carry on my life at present that is going to determine my future if my past has determined my present it's a fact it's also a fact that my present is going to determine my future so in whatever circumstances i may be there is actually there is a, the, it is ir, ir, uh, irrational just to think that i should not attempt any way to get out of it because of some past i am suffering if the past has resulted in the present my present is going to determine the future if i resort to the treatment if i uh, follow the directions if i uh, change my lifestyle these are going to help me a, in a great way to improve the quality of my life even in this birth what to speak of the next birth so those are the habits i am growing which is going to help me in future so that's the idea which we have to take home from this sutra that whatever circumstances we are we may be in at present we should try to develop some good samskaras whatever it even it is maybe spiritual or even it may be something which speaks of developing will power resilience all those things won't be lost they will be there as your strength your endeavor to develop grit resilience will power moral uh, strength spiritual strength all these endeavors won't be lost that if i find that in this life suddenly i have developed some lifestyle disease that occasion uh, makes me that previously i was not much uh, uh, aware or much co- conscious about uh, regulating my life within some proper lifestyle that occasion gives me a chance now that yes now let me regulate my life let me regulate my diet let me do some exercise these all become sanskaras this habit becomes sanskara we find that it's not that the people don't know that uh, proper diet and exercise is going to make a marked difference in their life they know but it is the lethargy procrastination all those things which won't allow them to resort to that even if you're constantly uh, just making someone aware of those fact you find that procrastination is so strong lethargy is so strong okay from tomorrow i will start they never start so once we start this becomes sanskara even immediately we will find its effect in this life not only this life these all samskaras are something you may not remember those samskaras in the next birth what all samskaras are there within me i never see them but they are constantly seeing me they are constantly seeing me and they are constantly guiding my life regulating my life so if i develop some good samskaras they are not lost that in the bhagavad gita we will find krishna is saying that neha bhikramana shosti pratyavayana vidyate swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat there is a sloka of gita in what is the idea that all the samskaras which we develop they are never lost to give an example that when suppose uh, in our day to day life a, the bridge a bridge is under construction and now uh, for some reason uh, when the uh, construction is on the half way the uh, bridge collapses it couldn't be completed because of some technical defects so what happens till then whatever work has been done to, uh, it couldn't be completed neither it could be completed and all the money that half of the bridge which you have done that that got wasted so both this one thing is that i couldn't reach the goal and also there was a waste of energy time resource everything was wasted when you are growing sanskara even if i am not completing my goal suppose i wanted to learn music i still remember one swami i was senior swami in the very old age he used to practice harmonium and he will just sing the this you know the tunes the, the ragas he won't be singing 
and someday we ask swami ji if yeah, you are just learning the ragas now and just learning to play harmonium when will you sing so he will say in the next birth so the i so he used to just in a jovial way used to say the idea is these are going is going to remain as sanskaras it's not lost when you get a, you have developed a taste for it in favor in future when you get a favorable circumstances they simply sprout so that's the idea that in this life instead of constantly blaming others for the situation in which i am in without taking the responsibility on my own shoulder if i just go on blaming it's in no way going to help me that itself becomes a habit blaming others and that will find expression even in the future life that always i will just search excuses in by blaming others that will become a habit instead of that if i take that that this that i let the responsibility in my own shoulder and whatever is possible in that situation if i try to do something positive that is going to become a samskara and that samskara may be immediately i may not get favorable circumstances because the present is determined by my past so naturally most probably the circumstances is not going to change immediately but all those new samskaras which you are developing that will gravitate you in future to certain circumstances where you will find those circumstances find favorable circum favorable conditions that's the meaning of the word ekarupa once it gets the favorable circumstances now it will just spontaneously sprout so even as far as spiritual practices are concerned there sometimes we say we don't get time we have so, so much busy i don't develop i don't have any inclination for meditation we find that all the spiritual traditions speak that whether you like or not whether you have the mood or not make it a routine in the morning in the evening when the nature is calm use that to settle down and meditate if not for long at least for short time half an hour if half an hour is not possible 10 minutes 15 minutes make it a point you don't miss it what's happening you may not see any visible result immediately but it is forming a samskara sometimes it is not perceptible at all as swami vivekananda used to say that spiritual evolution is just like the falling of the dew drops when the torrential rain is there i can see the rain is falling the ground is getting drenched but when the dew drops fall it is unnoticed you don't see in the morning when you just move out to walk on the lawn or on the grass you find it's wet when it has fallen you haven't seen it was totally unperceived the sanskaras develop that way it is totally unperceived slowly it develops the example which we gave in some previous class just how the shiva linga is formed some coarse rock is lying on the bed of the river over which the water is flowing at any point of time if you look at the rock there is no change it's the same coarse rock but in 100 years the change is there which is unperceptible it is gradually gradually getting smoothened in 100 years the same coarse rock converts into that wonderful shiva linga so our mind is also like that it may be like that coarse rock it seems as if so hard to change but the constant flow of sublime thoughts good thoughts is something which is making some changes though it is unperceptible the change is going on it may take time but it is going to happen it is bound to happen so instead of being fatalistic by saying that i am suffering because of my past what can i do we should use each and every circumstance of life as an opportunity to develop some good samskaras so that once you have good samskaras this karma finds expression in two way that by doing a thing again and again you develop a samskara and once the samskara is developed you will be naturally gravitated those has to full has to be fulfilled you will be gravitated to a circumstances where all those samskaras will find favorable circumstances to fulfill it is it is something which is the law of nature so that's the implication we have to take so uh, from this sutra that we have to be always positive in our life whatever the circumstances may be in that circumstances in how, in what all way i can 
make use of that situation to the best of my uh, uh, purpose. That's the thing which uh, this sutra implies it. So next, let us go to the 10th sutra, the next sutra. Tasam anaditvacha ashisha nityatvat. Now all these vasanas, how many are there? As we told, it's not only the thing which are manifested. There are so many unmanifested vasanas which are hidden because this present life is not favorable for their expression. So how many are there? Innumerable. Why? So this sutra says that how they have developed. Tasam anaditvacha ashisha. The word ashisha means the desire for self-welfare. So this is the idea that what happened that just take as the, uh, uh, in the biology, it has been spoken of that the entire theory of evolution, it started with the micro, which has evolved to a complex, all the complex organisms, all the complex, all the evolved creatures. But when the life started, the first micro, what happened? The conscious principle got attached with this micro body. And it started thinking, I am this micro body. And once you think you are a body, whether it's a big, uh, it's a, a complicated, a big bo uh, organism like human being or any other creature, or even it is just a single cellular microbe, the first reaction is, I want to preserve that because I'm identified with that. So this desire for self-welfare evolves the moment the conscious principle out of ignorance gets associated with any form of body big or small, and immediately develops that desire to preserve that. That's the idea of self-welfare. So this, this desire for self-welfare in Sanskrit, in Yoga Sutra, technically has been used as a word, Ashisha. So from when the Vasanas have started developing, from the very beginning when the life have evolved, and with that, the, uh, this Ashisha also came into existence. That whenever I find that a microbe in a petri dish, if you give some nutrient, it will run towards it. If you give some toxin, it will run away from it. So that speaks of the Ashisha. It never wants to get killed. It wants to leave. It wants to sustain. It wants its own welfare. And with that, this all the vasana started developing. So this, what is the vasana? That some vasanas are positive, some are negative. That when I see some nutrient, I'm drawn towards it. The desire has developed. This is good for me. So this, this one vasana, it is going to stay. If I give some toxin, it will run away from it. That is also a type of reaction. I want to be alive. I don't want to die. So if I see something which is uh, going to be detrimental for my physical existence, I run away from it. This fight and flight response. That is another set of vasana. So from the very first evolute of life, you find these vasanas. Because of that desire for self-welfare is there, these vasanas are developing. And they're not lost. Each of them are saved in your subconscious mind. They're all there. Once it develops, it's never lost. So from when these vasanas have developed, from the very this initial stage of uh, this, our life, when because of ignorance we started, identifying ourselves with the psychophysical existence. That's the idea of Ashisha. So, so from that very beginning, these vasanas are there. So desires for self-welfare being eternal, the vasanas are also without beginning. So that's the uh, meaning of this sutra. Tasam anaditva cha ashisha nitvatva. As the Ashisha is something eternal, so, so these vasanas are also eternal. So the next question, of course, comes how to get, this is the chapter on Kaivalya. So this yoga will gradually take us uh, that how we can uh, liberate ourselves. If there are so many innumerable vasanas in life, in this life, we find that if I have developed an addiction for smoking, just that one vasana to get rid of that one vasana, how much struggle we have to go through. Now, if I say there are innumerable vasanas, then immediately you get disheartened. That how is it possible to liberate myself? If just to get read of one vasana is so difficult, if you say they're innumerable. So Yoga Sutra is a science. First, it is making you aware 
There are innumerable asanas. But they, then at last, this is, uh, chapter will end with that idea that there is a process by which you need not have to take care of each and every vasana individually. All can fall apart at in one go, rendering you that freedom from this uh, psychophysical existence. So that, uh, to that procedure, it will take us. First, it is making us aware. We should know that in what state we are in. So that's the thing they're doing at present. The 11th Sutra again will say that how the Vasanas are kept held together. It's there to, to suffer something to exist. Certain factors should be there for its existence. So what are the factors which ensures the existence of the Vasana? So what are the uh, various factors? Hetu, Phala, Asraya, Alambana. These are the four factors. Hetu, Phala, Asraya and Alambana. What are they? We will discuss. Samgrahitvat. So when these four factors are there, all, all of them, if one is missing, the vasana won't find expression. It will be there, but it will be hidden. But if all these four factors are existing at a time, the vasana will, manifest it, will be manifested. As we told, that some vasanas are manifested, some are hidden. So what are the factors which enables the vasana to be manifested? So these are the four factors. Hetu, Phala, Asraya, Alambana, Sangrahit, Tattva. Means that all the four should be there together. Esham, Abhave, Tat, Abhava. If these are not there, the Vasanas will fall off. So what actually this Hetu, Phala, Asraya, Alambana means? Hetu means the cause. You know that even in Indian language, uh, which all have derived from Sanskrit, uh, you will find that the Hetu, is in most of the regional language also. It's a Sanskrit word, which means cause. What is the cause means hetu. Phala means the result. Asraya means the receptacle. Alambana means by holding unto which a thing exists. So again, still it is uh, technical. So we have to resort to Vyasa Bhashya, to Vyasa's commentary to understand the meaning of these words. So what, uh, uh, how has been, it has been described? <coughs> Hetu, the cause. What is the cause of vasana? Just as in the previous sutra, we already studied. Ashisha, the desire for self-welfare. That is the cause. But again, we shouldn't stop there. Why we have the desire for self-welfare? Because of asmita, the moment I have that sense of limited sense of individuality, that I am this body-mind complex. From that, the desire to preserve my body-mind complex comes. So Ashisha, the cause of Ashisha is Asmita, and the cause of Asmita is ignorance. So ultimate cause of all the Vasana is ignorance, the Agyana, that the moment the conscious principle by coming in association with uh, the mind starts thinking itself as the mind. That's because of ignorance. Just the way when a white, a red flower is placed in proximity of a prism. The prism appears to be red, tinged with that red color, but it is not actually red. As because of its proximity uh, to the red flower, it appears to be red. Similarly, when the conscious principle comes in association with the Prakriti, the Prakriti appears to be something which is conscious. The mind appears to be conscious, but actually it is not. And the Purusha gets deluded. It starts get, getting identified with the Prakriti. And that's how all the uh, evolutes of ignorance as Asmita, uh, Avidya, Asmita, Raga, Desha, Abhinivesha all follow. So the ultimate Hetu for which the Vasanas has developed is Agyana. So cause that as long as the ignorance is there, Vasanas are bound to be there. So here you will find the indication. Yoga Sutta is gradually taking us that we have to go beyond the ignorance. If we really have to go, uh, get rid of the vasanas. It's not by getting rid of one desire at a time, I can get rid of all the this, uh, vasanas. They're innumerable. But if I can get rid of the ignorance, all the vasanas will fall off. So Hetu, the cause of all the vasanas is this uh, ignorance. Follow, what's the result? 
from the vasanas, all these desires, they are hidden in my mind. But how they find expression, how they become vyakta, smriti, if the memory of it comes back, then immediately uh, the vasana becomes manifested. So the result of vasana is smriti. So you, the cause ignorance should be there. Its effect, as the effect, the memory should be there. And then the asraya. What's the asraya, the receptacle in which these vasanas are stored? Of course, the mind. As long as the mind is there, just it is like the computer hard disk in which all your files are stored and the, uh, the, the memories are stored. So here also the same thing. This Your mind, the chitta, the mind stuff is the asraya. And what is the alambana? Alambana means the uh, holding onto which those vasanas find expression. They are the objects. The, the moment I see a flower, that flower becomes the alambana. Now, very interesting. The moment I see the flower, it how, how I'm seeing the flower, the flower is just a suggestion that the idea of flower is already there in my mind. My mind is not something tabula rasa, it's not a vacant thing. The idea of the flower is already there in the mind. When I see the flower, that which was hidden in the mind, that idea of the flower, that is, gets projected. The moment it gets projected. So that's why this all this astra, the reciprocal mind is also necessary. Just if a flower is there, but if no, no conscious being is there, there's no question of vasana that I let me go and pluck it and smell it. That desire cannot come. So the mind where all those ideas are hidden, that's the asraya. And then what, and, and when it is there, uh, after all this, uh, how the mind is existing is because of uh, ultimately the asmita, because of the ignorance that my conscious principle has came in association with the psychophysical existence to enliven it. So the ignorance, because of the ignorance, this, uh, uh, the, it's possible to see the flower and then pluck it and smell it. So this uh, the fall, the effect, why I just have the motivation to go and pluck it and smell it? Because already the uh, memory of it is there. Previously, I have seen a flower which is having a wonderful fragrance and seeing this flower, that memory comes back. And then what happens? It motivates me to go and just pluck it and smell it. So these are the four factors without which the vasanas cannot find expression. It cannot manifest. Uh, so that's the uh, thing which has been uh, indicated in this sutra. So uh, these ideas are very simple, but because of the words, it appears to be technical. So just uh, to understand this, all the specific, this specific words. So suppose for the first time you are going to some place of worship. And suddenly you find that your mind is highly uplifted. You never thought that you will feel so sublime. What has happened? The place of worship is the alambana, is the external suggestion. For the vasanas, which are stored in the chitta, previously, some, most probably in my past birth, I have already developed the sanskara of the spiritual worship, going to the devotional, uh, spiritual, uh, going to the religious place and spending some time there. And while spending the time there, I already felt some that uh, spiritual fervor there, tested that, and that is coming back as smriti. The chitta is the asraya, the mind is the asraya, where all those sanskaras are hidden. So when I'm going to that place of worship, they find an expression, the smriti comes back. That, ex that as a memory, that past sanskaras get revived. And this, all these things are happening, why? Because after all, I as a psychophysically individual being is still in the process of transmigration. Why it is happening? Because of the ignorance that after all, I am the psychophysical entity. So as long as that is there, so these vasanas are bound to find expression. If any of this factor is not there, then the vasana won't find expression. It's very scientific that we say that that in, there are innumerable vasanas that uh, so sometimes jokingly we just give that example that as a grazing animal, if we have evolved uh, through the biological evolution, most probably we were some grazing animal. 
And as a grazing animal, we had a tremendous liking for the green grass. So if it is a sanskara, if it is not lost, it is supposed to be there in my mind. Why don't I salivate seeing the green grass as a human being? Because that vasana is not favorable for the human birth. So it doesn't find expression. So this is the idea which gradually now will be spoken of in this uh, sutra. Uh, this 12th and the 13th sutra will be speaking that wonderful idea. Atita, the 12th sutra. Atita anagatam swarupata asti. Adhva bhedat dharmanam. This in essence, atita anagata, this, all those vasanas were there in the past, are going to be there in the future. They are not going to be lost. Swarupata, in essence, they are there. But we, uh, what happens, the characteristics change with the lapse of time. So the, what the characteristics are, they may be manifested or they may not be manifested. So that will be spoken of in the next sutra. So though the vasanas remain same in essence with the lapse of time, their characteristics, adhva veda means lapse of time. With the lapse of time, uh, they, with the lapse of time, uh, their characteristics may change. The characteristics, what are the characteristics? It may be either manifested or may not be manifested. So that's the thing which is indicated in the 12th sutra, the 13th sutra will elaborate it. Te, the 13th sutra, te vyakta shukshma gunatmanaha. Te vyakta, either they are vyakta, manifested, or sukshma, subtle, means they are not unmanifested. They are there. As a subtle vasana, they are there. And this happens because of the play of the three gunas, sattva, raja, tam. These sutras are uh, uh, very technical. Actually, we are trying our best uh, to use some examples and try to understand. If you just go to the commentary, even the commentary you will find is very difficult to understand. It's only with the help of examples we can understand what this sutra speaks. So this 13th sutra, sutra we will take it in a bit elaborate way to really understand what it is speaking. So the characteristics of the vasanas may be manifested or subtle, means unmanifested, as per the mutation of the gunas. The moment we say gunas, immediately you all will understand it is sattva rajatama. But if we really try to uh, understand what this sattva rajatama means, you will find that we generally don't have a very clear understanding of sattva rajatama. First, let us today try to understand this what this sattva rajatama means. Generally, we say the uh, in our scripture they say this world is nothing but the mutation of the three gunas, sattva, raja, tama. These three gunas constitute the entire universe. It makes no head and we can make no head and tail out of it. What does it mean that the world is made up of three gunas, sattva, raja, tama? They some will be saying that uh, yes, the sattva means illumination, raja's activity, tamas means darkness. So this world is constituted of illumination, activity, darkness. What does it mean? Still, again, you don't have any clear idea. It's just some words we are saying, which, of, which we can never relate. If we really try to understand this, uh, the meaning of Sattva Rajatama, you will find something wonderful concept is hidden in these words. This world is nothing but the conglomeration of these three gunas, Sattva Rajatama. It is in no way speaking of the external world. It is speaking something the moment I perceive the external world and it becomes real. And that's in that process, this, the mutation of these three gunas are happening. And there is nothing apart from these three gunas. In our scriptures, they will say that all the organs of perception, jnanendriya, your eyes, ears, the smell, the nose, taste, the tongue, and skin, the touch. These are sattva. Okay, just we will give you the some clues to uh, at last go to that uh, to understand what sattva rajatama means. So these jnanandriyas are pure, vishuddha sattva. Karmendriyas are all the organs of action. They are 
विशुद्ध रजस प्योर रजस मीन्स योर हैंड योर फिट वॉक दर स्पीच दैट द एक्टिविटी एंड ऑर्गन ऑफ एक्सक्रीशन एंड ऑर्गन ऑफ प्रोक्रिएशन दिस आर द फाइव ऑर्गन ऑफ एक्शन सो दीज आर प्योरली रजस and what is the tamas the panchabhuta and the tanmatras are the tamas and we think that panchabhuta means the external all the inert things which we are seeing which has no life they are all panchabhuta and tanmatras means the subatomic particles in that way we can never understand the concept of sattva raja tama actually tanmatra means peace meal perception what tamas means with an example we will try to understand first when i am seeing a red flower a red fragrant flower i have the idea that, that this my perception is as a as a whole it is happening the flower is fragrant but very interesting the perception is piecemeal if the if you really go to even to the modern uh, uh, what you say the neurology study of neurology they also will say the same thing it's not the flower as a whole which is being perceived in my mind the redness is perceived in the color perception center its shape is perceived in some other the shape uh, some other perception center is meant for uh, perceiving its shape there is another center by which i can by touch i can perceive its texture through my nose the smell is going and there is a particular center for perceiving the smell so now what is happening this all perceptions are all separate piecemeal perceptions discrete perceptions these all are conglomerated together to give you a sense of whole that this flower is fragrant but the perceptions are all piecemeal and that piecemeal perceptions again very interesting that redness is not outside it is the idea of redness is already in my mind when i see the flower it is not the redness which is coming from outside inside my uh, mind and i am is getting registered it's just the opposite the light just falls on my retina the light's function stops there from the retina it is the optic nerve is taking some op- some nervous current so from the optic nerve is taking some nerve impulse which is going to the color perception center it is not actually perceiving the color the color is thrown out and it goes and envelops the flower to give you a sensation that it is red so the all the colors red green blue is not out there it is all in my mind but hidden how long it is hidden as long as i have not seen the flower it was there in my mind hidden it was in darkness so all these piecemeal perceptions the texture when i see so suppose i see a, a digit 7 of red color the redness is perceived in color perception center the digit perception has a separate center in that center i perceive the digit the digit also is hidden that uh, the concept of the digit is hidden in the mind all these piecemeal perceptions hidden in the mind are the tanmatras tatmatra this tatmatra will say it's piecemeal only that when i see the flower as a whole it is red it is having such and such and such shape it is having such and such fragrance all this constitutes the flower but the perception never happened as a whole it all happened piecemeal and all those piecemeal perceptions the idea of that was already hidden in the mind the flower was the suggestion to activate that so all those as tanmatra were hidden in the mind when the mind got activated all those tanma tanmatras conglomerated to form the panchabhuta panchabhuta is the conglomeration of the tanmatras this it this flower is red and it has a nice fragrance it has such and such texture all this now mix up to give the concept of panchabhuta so now you will understand the tanmatras and the panchabhutas why they are tamas because unless the external stimuli is there they are all in darkness in your mind it speaks nothing of the external world it is not denying the external world external world is there but what it is we can never know we can never know 
the moment the external world is always just a suggestion what i know is a projection of the mind so all those ideas are in the mind is tamas all this external world where i see seeing the light is falling on the flower is reflected and falls on my eyes this illumines the all the thing which was already hidden as tamas this sat this stimuli illumines that so you will you will you have heard the word the three gunas are constantly mutating this have we have heard we all always say but what it means see the stimuli mutates the tamas the tamas which was hidden that gets active now the moment that the light falls the smell comes all those immediately give that illumines the all those concepts which were in the dark to project as that red flower so this is the sattva from the tamas it came once it came now the rajas what's the rajas your response to it what's the response that the morning just when i was sleeping by the side uh, side of the window my bed is by the side of the window i woke up opened my eyes saw a beautiful rose red rose has bloomed and most probably i have i am a devotee i have a small shrine in my house immediately i feel tempted inclined to get up move out pluck the flower and come and offer it to the altar so these are activities through your feet through your hand that is finding expression that's why they are all pure rajas so now you will understand when they say the entire world is three gunatmika can you think anything apart from this it is this process by which the external world is getting illumined and we are interacting uh, to do that with that world because of that so what is happening this all this piecemeal perceptions tanmatras are the tamas the illumination which is happening through your five senses gyanendriyas is converting the tamas to sattva and that is resulting in action so now if we say that when i say this world is triguna mai in the modern language if i in the modern scientific language if i want to translate the word triguna its real actual translation will be it will be very easy to understand if i say this triguna is nothing but stimuli response conditioning now you will understand that all the stimuli what is the external stimuli what it is doing it is activating my mind all those ideas are already there just the way in the library you go you want certain book the librarian will search for the access number go to the exact rack pick it up the external suggestion is doing the same thing it is coming and now it is saying the red color has to be picked up there are so many colors red color is picked up such and such texture has to be picked up that is picked up and this all comes together and ah, this is this flower this is a red flower this is such as this such as fragrance so all those ideas hidden in the mind stan matras they are picked up by this external suggestion and now you react to it so this is the three gunas stimuli response conditioning because picks of the three gunas so because of the now we go to the sutra the 13th sutra that because of the mutation of the three gunas some of the vasanas will be manifested some won't be manifested so again if we try to understand by words it will be very difficult let us take some example you will understand what it is speaking now we in the previous sutra we already start there are four factors required to keep the to manifest the vasanas what are they avidya bhoga smriti chitta chitta and the panchabhuta that as the cause as the hetu was the ignorance follow was the smriti the memory and uh the receptacle the ashraya was the mind stuff the chitta and uh, alambana the holding on to which they find manifest is the panchabhuta or the tanmatras so this all these four factors has to be there if one of them is missing the vasana won't manifest so now with example we will understand what it is speaking see sometime the illumination itself doesn't happen so all the so called your uh, vasanas as smriti there is no chance to come out how it happens very interesting with example you will understand see the nocturnal animals an owl can see at night i cannot see 
as a human being, my eyes is constituted, is designed to see from this, what is the Vibgeo? I can see from violet to red. I cannot see infrared. When I say at night, everything is dark. Actually, it is not dark because of the diffraction of the sun rays. Still light is there. The sunlight is not falling directly. It is on the, on the other hemisphere, but it's diffracted rays still illumines the other hemisphere, which appears to be dark. The nocturnal animals in the zoo, if you go, you will find that where the nocturnal animals are kept, it is dark. And where the aquarium in which they are, in the glass case in which they are kept, there's a very mild red light. Why? Because that's, that's the light, which is the meeting point of our perception and theirs. We, ours is the lowest, is the red light we can see, and theirs is the highest. So if it is dark, they won't come out. If I just, if you keep the ordinary light, they cannot see. Their eyes are constituted to see infrared. They cannot see the uh, the or they cannot see. The above red, they cannot see. So the red they have kept so that the for them, it is all lighted. Then only they will come up. In the zoo, the purpose is we have to see the animals. If it's dark, if they're, uh, they're hiding themselves, we cannot see. So that's why everything is dark, only where they are there, that light is there. And there you go and you can see there's animals. So what's the idea? That as a human being, we cannot see infrared light. So the question of seeing the things at night doesn't exist at all. So if I am taking birth as a human being, even the perception which the nocturnal animals has is not possible for me. So naturally, the way the nocturnal animals catches its prey at night, it's not possible for me. Most probably if I was a nocturnal element in my past, past birth, then my vasanas are there. That I, as a nocturnal animal, I was depending on the prey at night. So those desires are there, but those desires are not, why they're not finding manifest, are not manifested in this life? Because the question doesn't arise because the perception itself is not happening. So the gunas cannot mute it. If I cannot see at night and the uh, seeing the uh, spray at night is not possible. So if it is not possible, then how come the smriti, the memory of it come? It won't come because the gunas has not muted it at all. Everything is in dark. So the object of perception may be present, but the jati in which the individual has taken birth may not be able to perceive it because of the limitation of the senses. So this, as we just now told, the nocturnal animals sees at night what humans cannot. So there was the gunas cannot mute it. And there's a prevalence of tamas. So once the tamas is prevalent, there's no question of the smriti to be revived. So one of the, once the smriti is not revived, so there's no question of the vasana to be manifested. So now you will understand that that is one of the reasons. And another reason is that sometimes the object is perceptible, but the corresponding smriti may not arise. Just as we told that when as a human being, I see the grass, the grazing animal also see the grass. So here perception is happening, but we being human being, the, we are constituted in such a way that though we perceive the smriti won't arise, that the rest, that it won't find expression as the rajas. Though the sattva is there, but it cannot mute it into rajas because that the liking, that bhoga smriti, that is subdued. It, it won't uh, rise up as a human being here as it is not favorable. So the gunas are not mutating, so they will remain hidden. So you will find actually these sutras are extremely scientific. Even in the modern psychology, if we can relate and study, it speaks something wonderful. And so it was how in tremendous depth they have went to understand the psyche of the, this, all the creatures. So this, how nicely they say, there's this Vyakta Shukshma Gunatmana. As per the mutation of the gunas, either it may be manifested or it may not be manifested, it will be Shukshma. So now we will understand that why in certain birth, some of the vasanas are manifested, others are not. Because of the mutation of the gunas, uh, uh, in a particular way, all the four factors cannot come together 
and that way the when the four factors cannot come together this all the vasanas which uh, cannot be manifested because they have couldn't come they remain hidden in your psyche they won't manifest but they are there in some future circumstances if they get favorable circumstances to mute it they will find expression so that's what has been spoken of in the 13th sutra so now this so from the 14th to the 16th now that will discuss that how our perceptions it, it, that is also something very interesting that we think that, that what i see is truth if that be truth if that is truth then why there is fight uh, when there is a match going on with the two teams going on and some uh, quarrel among the players uh, ensues and then there's a tremendous fight in the stadiums there are so many incidences and when they are interviewed you will find that both are sincere both the groups they say that the other party is at fault so if our perception is something what i see is true i don't question my perception then how come these two people they both are sincere it's not that they are lying they have this totally varied opinion whenever anything happens an accident has happens has happened in the road you go and ask the witnesses that what has happened you will find all have va- this varied way of narration all not a single narration will be uh, telling with the others so what if i what i see is truth uh, then why this so many narrations so that has been wonderful that these vasanas have a great role to play in what i really see the students class we will end just with an example which is very very famous example in vedanta in yoga that there is a stump a tree has been cut or it has fallen in the storm but the stump is still remaining in the uh, uh, it's in the one, one corner of a park in the evening in the twilight hours when it is about to be dark from a distance the lover thinks it's to be its beloved most probably he or she came to the park to meet his beloved from a distance seeing that stump it the he or she thinks it's to be its beloved the small child who was playing with others in the park now has to return home because it's all getting dark so the mother is waiting somewhere uh, to take him take the child back the child seeing the stump thinks it's to be its mother the mother who is in search of the child thinks it's to be its, its child it's uh, the that uh, thinks it thinks uh, that it to be its child and suppose a police came there was in search of some thief he got the news that somewhere near the park he is hiding or uh, he is uh, has escaped and is hiding in the park so the police from a distance think it to be the thief and the thief who is in uh, who is just running away from the police thinks it to be the police the same stump appears it's in as so many things why because the vasanas which are getting manifested in each and every individual and that way affecting conditioning the perception so our perceptions gets biased because of our vasanas and that will be wonderfully explained with this uh, three sutras from the 14th to the 16th which we will take up again in the next class with this we stop our discussion today namaskar thank you